Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fountainhead Discussion Group hosted by the Ayn Rand Institute. My name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow and instructor at the Institute. Uh, shortly, I'll be joined by my colleague, Keith Lockich. But let me start with first a few reminders and announcements. Uh, one is if you are watching on one of our social media channels on either Facebook or on YouTube, that's great. But if you'd like to be able to interact with us directly by uh, asking questions or making comments or answering our questions, because we try to make this interactive, the best way to do that is to participate through Zoom. I put the link to uh, the Zoom channel up on the screen. Uh, go there. You can register to uh, uh, to enter the Zoom room and get announcements about us, uh, about this group in the future. Uh, and please be sure if you are interested in what we're doing here, if you're interested in the Fountainhead, if you know other people who might be, uh, to tell them about this. This is the, the one link to give them with uh, everything uh, about this group that they need to know. Uh, so please share that link. Uh, also, the big part of the reason that we're doing this, apart from the fact that The Fountainhead is a great American novel, uh, is that we, the Ayn Rand Institute, sponsor the world's largest essay contest uh, about The Fountainhead. We've been doing it for decades. We've pushed the deadline back uh, to May 28th this year, because we know a lot of people are sitting at home looking for things to uh, read and think about. And if you're a student, if you're a high school student who'd also like the chance to win perhaps some scholarship money, then entering our Fountainhead contest is a great way to do that. The deadline's May 28th. The top prize is $10,000. There's uh, also runner-up prizes as well that are in cash form. So if that's something that you're interested in, or if, again, something that other people you know are interested in, please share information with them about that as well. Also tell you briefly about uh, the fact that the Ayn Rand Institute sponsors a free app for your smartphone, the Ayn Rand University app. This is uh, where uh, our recordings of this discussion section will be archived in the future, but we also have uh, hours and hours, hundreds of hours of free content, lectures and courses that you can take to learn more about Ayn Rand's philosophy. So you can find that either on uh, your Android store or on the iOS Apple store. Otherwise, if you are watching with me on Zoom now, uh, and you want to participate in today's conversation, there's going to be two ways, two major ways to do that. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like us to answer, hover over your video screen. You'll see a button at the bottom that says Q&A. Press that button and a Q&A module will pop up. If you, that's the best place to send a question. And we'll try to look at those questions as they come in, if they're relevant to what we're talking about. As we're talking about it, we'll look at them. We'll try to answer them. Otherwise, we'll try to save some time uh, at the end. And we'll probably have an extra whole bonus episode where we answer a lot of unanswered questions I know that there have been a lot. Uh, otherwise, if you want to just make a comment, um, the chat box is the best place to do that. Occasionally today, we're going to ask you questions, what you think about different things about the reading uh, that we looked at today. And uh, writing in the chat is the best way to do that. Uh, we'll see what you write in the chat. Nobody else will see. The other attendees won't see. So don't worry uh, too much about that. It's not, uh, it's not public. So uh, I'm also going to put up a poll because we want to find out more about who you are and why you're watching. Uh, and the best way to measure that is to uh, find out what your experience with The Fountainhead is. Are you reading it for the first time? Are you rereading it? Did you read it before, but you're participating in the series without rereading it? Uh, or are you just following along without even having read it at all? Uh, definitely looking to find out what kind of audience you're re uh, reaching. And if you're in Zoom, I'll leave that poll up uh, for the duration of today's session. One last uh, item, which I didn't actually put on uh, a slide here, is that if you value what we're doing with this session, uh, then you should be aware that, that this and the other activities of the Ayn Rand Institute are made possible by the generous support of our donors. And so the first thing that we want to say uh, especially if you're a donor who happens to be watching, is thank you so much for making these kinds of events possible. And I know that people who are watching at home for free probably share in that gratitude as well. But if you value what we do and you're not currently a donor, 
Uh, I would also recommend uh, considering becoming an ARI member. And I, didn't, I don't have this on the slide, but you can go to a simple URL, einrand.org slash donate. Uh, and you can sign up for a $10 a month membership or whatever you feel is appropriate. And I see Keith has just put that link in uh, the chat as well. So please uh, consider trading value for value with us on that kind of, on that kind of subject. Okay, so uh, I think Keith is out there now. I'm going to turn my screen share off, and you'll be able to see both of us. Hi, everybody. So, Keith, did you want to start off by doing the uh, the plot summary, or should I do that? Why, why don't you do a quick one, and I'll I'll jump in on the first question. Sure. So, just to bring people up to speed, especially if you haven't uh, been rereading uh, or following along, uh, to show you where we are at this point in the book, we're looking at the second half. Uh, of part two of The Fountainhead. And this was a part which was entitled Ellsworth Tui. We met Tui really in person for the first time in the first half of this part, but now we start to get some background. We're giving a, given a kind of life history of Tui from childhood through school to his rise to fame and his growing influence over the culture of the country through his uh, expertise as a kind of architectural and artistic critic. At the same point in time, we learn that Rourke's Enright House is finally going up for at least a brief moment. Dominique, who's been jaded about the chances of Rourke in this world, starts to seem to be gaining hope that maybe they can't beat Rourke. But at this point in the plot, something new uh, is introduced. This, this Hopton Stoddard character, a businessman who wants to build some kind of interdenominational temple. Tui suggests to Stoddard that he use Rourke. Uh, this is surprising. Tui's been indifferent about Rourke at best, uh, but uh, he does this knowing that Rourke's design will outrage the public, especially if he himself then goes and criticizes it. This looks like he's something that he's doing deliberately. I think Keith's going to say a little bit more about that. Uh, Tui's self-fulfilling prophecy then comes true, and when Stoddard sees the results of what Rourke has built and sees the outrage about it, he sues Rourke. Uh, at this point, there's a trial. Tui, Keating, and very interestingly, Dominique, then I'll testify against Rourke. We'll talk more about why. Uh, Rourke offers very little defense except his photos. He pulls a frine, as uh, Tui puts it, and he loses the suit. Keating, feeling guilty, tries to salvage his happiness by finally agreeing to marry Catherine, but then Dominique, seeking to punish herself for what she's done to Rourke, marries Keating instead. Dominique explains to Rourke that she's done this, uh, that she wants to destroy Rourke and herself, but that she loves him and he says he loves her. Lots of very interesting, dramatic and uh, complex conflicts unfolding in this section of the book, Keith. Did you want to say yeah, more so, about so I wanted what to pick up going there. on here? I wanted to pick up there and say a little bit about uh, the literary elements of what we're seeing here and how we're seeing um, the different things that we've been discussing, the themes and the characters and how those, and, and, and how the, the role of the Stoddard Temple situation or scenario in the development of the plot and the story. So the first question that we asked is what, to, or sorry, one of the questions that we asked, the first one we're gonna talk about is, what does the Stoddard Temple symbolize to Rourke, to Dominique, to Tui? And I wanted to talk about it, its role in the plot by way of um, getting at a little more what Ayn Rand is trying to do in this story. So Ayn Rand once summarized briefly the story of the Fountainhead as follows. She says, the story, this is a quote, the story presents the career of Howard Rourke, an architect and innovator who breaks with tradition, recognizes no authority with that of his own independent judgment, struggles for the, and, and struggles for the integrity of his creative work against every form of social opposition. So the story of the Fountainhead is Howard Rourke's struggle against, quote, every form of social opposition. So the, the, the drama and the conflict that Rand is creating in the novel is the conflict of Rourke kind of against everybody. Now, there are different ways that that is portrayed. In the part one of the book, which is named after Peter Keating and which, is, and which Peter Keating is sort of the symbol of this, um, Rourke is struggling against convention, against tradition, against what you what you would call second-handedness. People who aren't looking at his work 
and and judging it independently as good or bad using their own minds but but rather people who are just following convention looking for what others say is the good in architecture so work is a creative innovator uh, and and the, there's a way in which he's he's opposing the whole architectural profession you know and Peter Peter Keating is an example of somebody who's forging a career in that profession in the conventional way by seeking to give the clients what they want rather than having his own creative artistic vision so that's that's the kind of basic form of opposition that Rourke faces in his career. In part two of the book, in the first half of part two, which we looked at last week, we bring in another element of opposition that Rourke faces, and that is the opposition from Dominique Franken. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about Dominique last week, and the fact that she has this very complex set of premises and motives that, on the one hand, she worships human greatness, which she recognizes in Howard Rourke. But on the other hand, she has this conviction that greatness is doomed to be destroyed in a world that's dominated by mediocrity and convention and that sort of thing. And so based because of that tension, because she doesn't want to see Howard Rourke destroyed by the world, she ends up fighting against him, trying to take clients away from him. So this is another form of opposition that Howard Rourke faces. Now, the reason, I think we said this a little bit last week, the reason for portray, part of the reason for portraying Dominique in this way is because it adds to the dramatic conflict of the story. Imagine how the book would be if Dominique didn't have this very complex and contradictory set of motivations. Imagine if she were just somebody who recognized Rourke's greatness and loved him for it. You know, that would be wonderful in reality and they would live happily ever after. It would also just but be a would, boring Hollywood plot trope. It would not make interest, for a very right? interesting story. And part of what she, so, so this is Rand as a literary artist trying to heighten the dramatic conflict in the novel and create a, a whole set of dramatic conflicts that ultimately will have to get resolved in the climax of the novel in order to, you know, uh, as the story unfolds. So we have two categories. We have Rourke against the architectural profession and convention and society in that way. And in last week, in the first half of part two, we have the added opposition of Dominique Franken, the woman he loves, fighting against his career. So that's another form of dramatic tension. Now, what we're seeing in the readings for this week is a third element being brought in. And this is represented by the Stoddard Temple scheme. And I wanna just say a little bit about this because I think it's, it's, it, it sheds light on what is going on in the story and on the motives of all the characters. So how does the Stoddard Temple scheme come about? Notice that what happens is in spite of the basic form of opposition against the architectural profession you know, in spite of that, and in spite of Dominique fighting against him, trying to take clients away from him, Rourke is starting to succeed. He gets the Enright House, um, and he gets the Cord Building, he gets the Aquitania Hotel. In spite of all the opposition he faces, he's starting to achieve success as an architect and achieve the ability to do his work his way, which is what he's after, right? And it reaches the point where Dominique starts to think, maybe she was wrong. Maybe she was wrong about the world. Maybe she's wrong that it's not possible for Rourke to succeed in the world as it is. And she even gets to the point where she comes, she comes to Ellsworth Tui and she says, maybe, hey, Ellsworth, maybe we were wrong about this, you know? And she's happy that Rourke is succeeding, right? I could sleep with this Kent Lansing, whoever he is, right? She says on page 314. Um, so she she's and she is um, hopeful enough about the possibility of Rourke's success that she's even, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but she's even willing to pose as the model for the statue for the Stoddard Temple. Whereas previously she didn't want, to her, want beautiful art to be sullied by the eyes of the masses. Remember the statue of Helios that she throws down the air shaft because she doesn't want anybody else to be able to look at it. Now she's willing to you know, stand as a naked model for a statue in a public temple, right? That's I mean, really so this shows, yeah. 
how far she has come in her psychology um, to the point where she thinks maybe Rourke is going to succeed. And it's and notice that it's this conversation that she has with Ellsworth Toohey that gets him thinking about Hopton Stoddard and thinking about he starts to hatch this scheme for the Stoddard Temple. Now notice that up until now, Toohey has not actively been fighting against Rourke. His approach has been to say nothing and there, you know, try to ignore Rourke. Um, but it's, but uh, the fact that Rourke is starting to succeed and the fact that Dominique comes to tell him, this is what sets Tui off on, on this scheme to um, do the Stoddard Temple. Because previously Dominique had been this ally of his in trying to destroy Rourke. And so he's losing his ally and he's got to do something to make up for it. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's important to recognize that the whole Stoddard Temple situation is a ca deliberate calculated scheme that Ellsworth Toohey comes up with. He tells Hopton Stoddard exactly what to say to Howard Rourke to convince him to do the building. And he hides the fact that he's the one pulling all the strings in this way. It's a, so um, it's a calculated scheme that as, as the story unfolds in, in the part, in the readings that we, that we looked at this week, we see that it's a deliberate plot to undermine Rourke's career. Uh, it, it, it's, it, 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 look at, uh, there's a, a number of different things that it accomplishes. It undermines Rourke's career. It completely reverses and, and undercuts the hope that Dominique is feeling that maybe Rourke is going to succeed because she see that because it's such an enormous blow um, against Rourke. Um, and it, uh, it, it um, bolsters the, the, the approach to architecture that's represented by the profession that, and that Tui is trying to, um, is trying to support. Um, so, so in terms of the plot conflict, what this also does is it's adding a third element. Not only do we have Rourke struggling against just the, the, the architectural profession as it is, and he has to struggle against Dominique's, he has to struggle against the opposition of the woman he loves. Now he has Ellsworth Toohey consciously and deliberately engaging in machinations against him to undermine his career. So it's heightening the dramatic tension in the story even more. I think it's important to recognize that what we're seeing is, is, is a whole range of forms of opposition uh, arrayed against Howard Rourke. And added to that, Keith, I think is uh, what's interesting about Tui's reasons for being opposed to it. There's his stated reasons but are they the same as his real reasons? The fact that he's able to tell Stoddard the things that Rourke is going to say in response, that he knows what will appeal to Rourke, is very interesting to think about. There's something about the meaning and the value of the temple that Tui sees, and it's the same thing as Rourke and Dominique sees, and yet he's got a very different attitude toward it and a very different response. Uh, yeah, and that's I think gonna... that... I think that's very a very important. important point. There, there are there are only a handful of people in the story who, when they when they see Rourke's work, understand what an incredible artistic achievement it is, and how and, and in what way Rourke represents a cre is 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 a creative genius and a creative innovator. There are very few people who understand that and recognize it. But I I agree. What we're seeing is. Tui's reaction to that is very different from the reaction of Roger Enright or Austin Heller, or the people who see that and 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 want Rourke to succeed and support him. So okay. maybe we should move on to talk about one of the discussion questions, the one about the Stoddard Temple. We had asked, what does it symbolize to Rourke, to Dominique, to Tui, and then what does the transformation of it at the end symbolize? And I'd be interested to hear what people in the chat think about that. What, maybe the best place to start is what does it mean to Rourke? Uh, what does he intend it to mean to others who are, uh, who are seeing it? Um, Keith, I think you were gonna, and we can maybe also talk about what people wrote to us about this. 
Yeah, I mean, I, it off. I, I think, um, yeah, so, so the assignment for Rourke is to build a temple of the human spirit. And for him, it's an opportunity to design a building that represents his view of what, his view of man's greatness and what it looks like to, uh, to have a reverence for the individual, have a reverence for, for man, the hero. And, and that's, you know, he designs the building in a way that does that. Um, he designs it in a way, uh, uh, the way it's put in the book is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a setting that's appropriate to, to the contemplation of man as a hero. Um, yeah, Rebecca in the chat says it's a space for worshiping the human spirit. Um, in the uh, comment section on our Facebook post uh, earlier in the week, Gretchen said it symbolizes to Rourke and Dominique all that is great in man. Uh, we'll have to talk more about what it means to Dominique because it's a little, she's a little uh, complicated here. Uh, to Tui, it's a window into Rourke. It provides him with an avenue of attack in his war to destroy Rourke, says Gretchen. Uh, so I thought, Keith, that it was very interesting that when you look at the way the temple is described through Rourke's eyes and the way that it's described by Tui in his column, that each of them remarks on the same features, but puts it in a very different light. And there's almost a perfect counterpoint. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we're seeing it through Rourke's eyes, its lines were horizontal, not the lines reaching to heaven, but the lines of the earth. It did not cling to the soil, did not crouch into the sky. It seemed to lift the earth did not dwarf man, but stood as a setting that made his figure the only absolute, skipping a little bit. Uh, it's not sealed under, when you walk inside, you're not sealed under vaults, but thrown open to the earth around it, trees, the river, the sun. And then of course you see the city as the background, the figure of a naked human body. That's through Rourke's eyes. But then when we get to Tui's column, it's the alleged temples wide open like a Western saloon. It has a quality of loose orgiastic elation. It's uh, flauntingly horizontal, its belly is in the mud. And then the statue of a nude female in a place where men come to be uplifted speaks for itself and requires no further comment. Um, incidentally, Brian in the uh, Q&A had asked, why is it that no one in the trial seems to care that Dominique posed for the statue? And Brian, I'm not sure if everybody in the trial knows that. I don't know if everyone knows that it's Dominique. She hasn't made a, she hasn't announced it at the very least. Uh, maybe that's something we can talk about later when we get to the trial and to Dominique's uh, views. Keith, did you want to say more about Dominique? Because it's interesting that Gretchen had said that she that Dominique had the same view of the meaning as Rourke did, but then she testifies against Rourke at the trial. So is that well? I think what the best so way I to think summarize it? yeah. So I think I mean I think what we see in Dominique's testimony is uh, her return to the perspective. The, 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 the sort of pessimistic perspective that she has on the world. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, a real, it's, it's a very explicit statement of the view that greatness doesn't, that, that, it's, that the, sac the act of sacrilege is creating a great work of art in the world as it is and, and, and you know, creating something um, to be given to a world that's dominated by mediocrity and 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 the hatred of of uh, the great, you know this idea about he's casting pearls without getting you know the the, the saying about casting pearls among swine right and so um, Rand's take on this, which actually I think was a apparently this was something her husband said to yes. her that that she's casting pearls without getting even a pork chop in return from the swine right <laughs> i think it's something her husband said to her when she was working on this book and she was getting rejected yeah yeah um right so it's so you know who what what is what is the sin what is the tragedy here it's the man who values his pearls so little that he's willing to fling them into the muck so the the crime is is rourke shouldn't have created the building in the first place uh, for the world, you know, to to spit on and destroy. Um. So, as we as I mentioned, the trial this trial happens. 
uh, Rourke loses and he's made to pay uh, for alterations to it. Since this was Tui's scheme to make him do this in the first place, he naturally has plans for what to be done with the temple once the alterations are in place. He had wanted Stoddard to build a home, a home for subnormal children in the first place. And so now that's what he has uh, Stoddard do. He's got, he's got Stoddard wrapped around his little finger, says this is God's way of punishing you, the fact that you wanted to do this egoistic thing, build a temple. Um, and so they well, turn it's it interesting. into one. Let me just jump in there. It's interesting that he describes this, this is just gravy. So this is just icing on the cake. Yeah. In other words, his real goal in this scheme is to is to stop Rourke and to sh you know to stop Rourke and to go Dominique into uh, returning to her her original set of motives and premises. The fact that he can also use it to manipulate Hopton Stoddard to creating the home for subnormal children that's just a, that's just an added bonus. Yeah, it's the material benefit. That the material benefit is the gravy is interesting too. That his primary goal is doing something to Rourke. Um, and what happens with it? Well, he gets a uh, committee of very different architects together who compromise on a design, kind of like what you would imagine uh, Snight's architects doing, except uh, they're all given equal voice. And so it's a kind of, it's a, a mishmash or melange of their designs. Uh, it's this, it becomes this home for subnormal children. They look out, look to find the most hopeless cases of children who will then be the inmates uh, in this, in this uh, facility. And I think it's very telling that once they build it and once they staff it and get their inmates, you then see uh, there's a portrayal of the, of the neighborhood children who are gazing wistfully at the playrooms, the gymnasium, the kitchen. These children had filthy clothes and smudged faces, agile little bodies, impertinent grins and eyes bright with a roaring, imperious, demanding intelligence. But the ladies in charge of the home chased them away, calling them little gangsters. And then the kind of adding insult to injury is where you get the scene with Catherine and uh, the person named Jackie. Uh, Jackie's done some uh, really trivial uh, uh, art project, colors of scraps on a bunch of glue. And Catherine says, isn't it wonderful? Uh, there's no telling how far the child will go with proper encouragement. Think of what happens to their little souls if they are frustrated in their creative instincts. It's so important not to deny them their chance for self-expression. Well, who's being denied their chance for self-expression here? Is it, uh, is it Jackie or is it these kids looking in out from the outside or is it someone like Rourke? Um, and I think Ellen had a comment here about, uh, about Jackie as well. Uh, so should we talk about another one of the, the discussion questions about, yeah, uh, I think we should move about on. TUI? And, and we've, we've now we've been you know, asking or raising some, some points here, making observations about what TUI is doing and what his motives are. One of the questions we asked people to think about was uh, precisely that. He's viewed in society generally as a kind of great benefactor by, and by all these people who flock to him for advice and help whether we're talking about Keating or Catherine or his, his coterie of friends in school. So is it true, given what he does and given what he says to them and the kind of advice that he gives to them, is it right to think of what he's doing as being this great benefactor? Yeah, uh, I think I'd, it's... I'd, I'm definitely interested to hear what people in the chat say about this. We can, we can share some of that, but Keith? Yeah, so I think it's interesting now to take to... to so. The, the first chapter of this set of readings, um, I think it's chapter nine of part two, is where we, this is where we get Ellsworth Tui's kind of life story. We get his, his biography from his childhood. And we start to get more of a focus on him as a character. And we start to get some um, information that's gonna explain what his motives are, what, what he represents. Remember the, um, we talked about um, the theme of the novel as being the way Ayn Rand stated was that it's individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in man's soul. And we talked about the, the, a lot of the, what, what the characters are representing is variations on the theme of collectivism in man's soul. And um, 
So we start to get some insight into Tui's character from this point of view. Now, the thing is, when we see the different components of his story, um, th there are ways in which it's not, it, 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 he's a very complex character and it's not entirely clear what exactly he represents. So some of the answers that we're getting in the chat, Rebecca says that Tui is power hungry. Elizabeth says he doesn't take people's concern seriously. He laughs at Catherine when she says she's unhappy. I th now, I, we can come back to that when we talk about that a little more. I, th I don't think he, he's laughing at her in a way. Uh, he, he comes across in that scene as somebody who is um, sincerely trying to help her understand um, the problem that she's wrestling with. He doesn't laugh at her in a in a cruel uh, uh, kind of hateful way. The laughter is more of a gentle, patronizing laughter, and what what he really does to her is even worse than than laughing at her. We can come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, Rebecca says again he wants to reap human souls. Gretchen says one of his goals is for everyone to be unhappy. So I think all of that is true. Um, and there are How a lot of- How can we of... tell it's true? What's, what is it in the, in the text that tells us that? Yeah, well, why don't, why don't you say some things about it and then I can, I can jump in as well. Well, uh, it's, it's interesting to look at the kind of career advice that he gives, especially uh, you know, to his friends in school and then eventually later as a kind of mentor. Um, uh, the people who, when he, people come to him asking about what career they pursue, he says, don't pursue careers you're passionate about uh, that makes you down to earth. Don't do what you're talented at. That's superficial. Don't do what you love. It's childish. Uh, above all, don't choose what's selfish. He says a career should concern society. And then we get a kind of summary of the results of this. After leaving college, some of his protégés did quite well. Others failed. Only one committed suicide. Uh, it was said that he had a exercise beneficent, uh, beneficent influence on them, for they never forgot him. They came to consult him on many things years later. But they're often, uh, in, with, with some of the stories that we get about Tui's childhood, it's, it can be less clear. And I think it's a, it should be an open question in your mind, how are we supposed to interpret them? So consider the very first story that we get about Tui and his childhood, the story of where he turns the hose on Johnny Stokes, right? So, this, so the idea here is that Johnny Stokes is the bright, handsome, brilliant, uh, athletic, capable young boy, but who also is a bully at school and he beats up on beats up on the kids, right? Um, and Tui turns the hose on, so the, he's also comes from a poor family, and he's just gotten a new suit, which is you know is, is an expensive suit. And Ellsworth ruins the suit by turning the hose on it. Now, how are we supposed to interpret that? I think there's two possible ways that you could interpret that. It could be interpreted as a, 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 an act of courage in the face of injustice, right? But it could also be interpreted as to Els, young Ellsworth Tui taking an opportunity, finding an opportunity to spit in the face of somebody who represents the opposite of, you know, he's, he's this sickly, unattractive, gawky, uh, boy. And to the extent that he might ha feel um, a certain envy from uh, in looking at somebody like Johnny Stokes, the bright, capable, you know, able-bodied, uh, athletic young boy, um, this is an opportunity, you know, to, to just to spit in his face and to turn the hose on him. So I think you could interpret that scene in both ways. And looking at some of the, that career advice that I just mentioned uh, that he gives later may help disambiguate between which of those two things he's doing. Uh, yeah. And I, he, did, did he object to Johnny Stokes because he was a bully or did he object to Johnny Stokes because he was passionate, talented, do, doing things he loved, selfish, et cetera? And I think you could ask the same question about um, Tui's relationship with his niece, Ka Katie Halsey, right? Yeah. So we get a little bit of her story, her, her, uh, her parents pass away and she comes to uh, live with El her uncle Ellsworth Tui, right? 
And at first, I think do we just get this briefly um, in, in part one, as the first part of part two. Um, um, it's not a foregone conclusion that he thinks she should come and live with him, but what do we get on page 303 of the, of the story? She steps off the train and she has a look on her face. Um, when she stepped off the train in New York, her plain little face looked beautiful for a moment as if the future were opening before her and its glow were already upon her forehead as if she were eager and proud and ready to meet it. Um, as though she knows what it feels like to be the center of the universe, okay? So it's when he sees that look on Catherine's face that he decides she should come to live with him. Now, we're not told why he thinks she should come to live with him. And again, there's two ways I think that you can interpret that. On the one hand, he sees that look on her face. Now, well, I mean, I, we could put this as a question. Do you think it's because he sees that look of radiance and hope and, and, and eagerness toward the future and the idea of being the center of the universe and he wants to, her to live with him so he can nurture that and, <laughs> and help her develop and find her joy in life and succeed? Um, or is there something else? I mean, I think as the story unfolds, what we see is that he has the opposite motive. It's the same uh, ambiguity there was in that uh, final scene in our last reading when he's looking out at the skyscrapers. And he's saying, you know, you could look at this two ways. Here are these great benefactors, but for a few of whom none of us, none of this would exist. We should be gra grateful or they're, you know, spitting in our face and we should uh, be resentful. Actually, if that, uh, so we, we got, this was, this was a comment that we got from Gretchen. I think it was on Facebook um, who asked the question about in, in answering the question about the Stoddard Temple, Gretchen says, I don't, what I don't understand is what place Tui thinks he would have in that world. He loves luxury yet would destroy everything that makes wealth and luxury mm. possible. So that's true. And I think let's, let's recall what the quote that you were just uh, referring to, Ben, this is on page 281. He's talking to Dominique and he com he's commenting on the fact that there were, it said that there may be a dozen people throughout the ages um, who are responsible for all the greatness, you know, fundamentally all the greatness uh, um, that of which men are possible. And then he says there are two possible attitudes you could have towards us. Th they were great benefactors and we're all fed by the overflow of the magnificent wealth of their spirit and that we're glad to accept it in gratitude and brotherhood. Or we can say that by the splendor of their achievement, which we can neither equal nor keep, these 12 have shown us what we are we do not want the free gifts of their grandeur. A cave by an oozing swamp and a fire of sticks rubbed together are preferable mm. to skyscrapers and neon lights if the cave and the sticks are the limit of your own creative capacities. So what we hear Tui saying there is he would be, he would be, he would happily forego the luxuries that he enjoys today if it if uh um, if that means um, destroying and fighting against the achievements of, of the great individuals. If that second uh, of the two interpretations is, is really his, which we're starting to get more evidence that maybe, maybe it is. Yeah, um, and we see people echoing this in the chat. Um, Steve in the chat says, Tui does not want anyone to rise above the level of the mediocre. Um, Gretchen says destroying pride in others is part of his motivation. Yeah. Um, we should say just a little bit about how this also comes up uh, for uh, for Keating. Um, there are scenes between Keating and Tui where uh, he's got the, and we'll talk more about Keating's attitude toward the, the final opening of the Cosmos Lotnik building shortly, but uh, Tui says Dominique would have been a better decoration on his arms. Keating says he doesn't love her, but Tui says, I never thought you did, uh, but says you should, you're over exaggerating the importance of sexual love, uh, that the only way to achieve greatness is to deny your ego and personal love is 
is a great evil. Um, so I th maybe Keith, we should uh, wrap up with some of those uh, those catchphrases of his uh, at the end before we move to the next question. Yeah, As well, let me just so there, there's a there's a question in the Q and A module from I I apologize if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly Kaya Shimizu, who asks what role or place do non creators have in a world revolving around Ayn Rand's objectivist philosophy. You know, does everybody have to be great? Does Ayn Rand only favor the creators? I think let's, we'd like to uh, hold on to that question and save it for later in the novel. When we start to get towards the end of the novel, we get a more full perspective on Ayn Rand's view of exactly that question. So let's save that, uh, if you don't mind, we'll save that for a future session. And I'll say one thing about that, Keith, which is, well, we haven't yet gotten a, a full picture of what her view about creators is at this right. point in the novel. Uh, it, it seems pretty clear that she's got a favorable attitude to Rourke at this point, I think. Um, we're starting to see more of how she's got an unfavorable view of Keating and Tui. Uh, but even at this point, I mean, look at, look at Catherine. She's not this great creative genius, yet we're seeing that the author has a kind of favorable view of this, this, uh, this benevolent outlook on life that Catherine has, even if she's not a great productive genius. And there are things, it's, it's being suggested, there are, thing, there are better things she could do with that and worse things. And then, well, what is someone like, what effect is someone like Tui having on her versus what effect might the other characters have if Catherine had gotten to know them? And, oh. and Emmett in the chat mentions uh, Mike, the electrician. And Mike is another good example. He's not, a, he's not portrayed as somebody who's a creative genius, but he is somebody who thinks independently and recognizes the greatness of Rourke's work and they become friends. And what if, what if uh, Catherine had met Mike instead of Peter? <laughs> that would be an interesting story. Um, so we had also asked a question, uh, Connecting now to, or yeah, let's let's just go to, to Q3. We had also asked a question about uh, Catherine and Keating, because one of the most interesting uh, parallels that I noticed on this latest reading is in this section of the book, it's, it's made quite explicit that neither Catherine nor Keating are happy. Not only that, but neither of them are happy in spite of the fact that they are doing exactly what they say they want in life. And it's an interesting question of why that's the case. Uh, I'd be curious to hear more about what people in the chat think about that. I'll start by making some observations about Catherine, and maybe we'll talk more about Keating too. But there's a long conversation that Ka Catherine, long and revealing conversation that Catherine has with Tui with her uncle about this. She tells him she's terribly unhappy. Uh, and yet she says she's always, uh, that, that she's always done what she thought was right in life. She thinks what's right is to do what's unselfish. And she reports that she believes and that Tui has told her that if she does what's right, if she does the unselfish thing, that she'll be happy. And yet she's not, and she's perplexed by this result. She says, when I'm honest with myself, I know the only emotion I've felt for years is being tired. Not physically tired, just tired as if there were nobody there to feel anymore. She, uh, she gives specific examples of this. She says, uh, you know, she's becoming a kind of social worker uh, who also is supposed to give out life advice to others. And a girl who gets happily married against her advice this makes her furious. Another one needs a job. She finds one on her own and she becomes, in her own words, sore as hell because she didn't wait for Catherine to find it for her. Uh, she tells a boy who wants to go to college, though, to get a job, but he gets, but she gets angry because he wants to go to college. She notes she never did. Her diagnosis is she's becoming selfish in a way that's much more horrible than if she were some petty chiseler. Uh, and her puzzle is why is it that she set out honestly to do what she thought was right and it's making her rotten. 
she thinks maybe she's just too vicious and capable of and incapable of leading a good life and yet she doesn't understand how that could be because she's so sincerely tried and she observes most of the selfless people who act in the same way are also unhappy with the possible exception of her uncle who she thinks is happy whether she's right about that is an interesting question yeah so what's going on here again so, people in the chat you should you should comment yeah well, let's see our people um so part of what we're seeing here um i think one of the one of the philosophical themes of the book is uh an, an a, a questioning of our conventional understanding of, of certain basic moral concepts, selfishness, selflessness, altruism. And um, what, we're, what we get here, so Tui, so the, the part, the points that, that um, you just brought out about Catherine, this is in conversation with Ellsworth Tui, and he answers Catherine. And he, he explains to her why she's unhappy despite doing everything she thinks she's supposed to do to be a good person. Um, his answer is very illuminating uh, in terms of Ayn Rand's analysis of the true meaning of a certain moral perspective. The reason she's unhappy, Tui tells her, is because you know, she's, she's, she's still too concerned with her own happiness and her own virtue. She's still being too selfish. Um, she thinks that the way to be a good person, because this is what everybody says, is by sacrificing herself for the sake of others. But, but there's a, in a way, the reason she's doing that is because she thinks that is the path to happiness. And so what is Tui's answer to her? Well, you're still looking, you're still trying to achieve your own happiness there. Uh, what true selflessness consists of is not wanting anything to, to give up on your values. Um, and he puts this in very stark terms. So she talks about feeling horrible about the, the emotions that she feels towards you know, what Ben just described. And he says, you must be willing to suffer, to be cruel, to be dishonest, to be unclean, anything, my dear, to kill that most stubborn of roots, the ego. Um, he says, only then will you know the kind of happiness I spoke about and the gates of spiritual grandeur will fall open before you. Now she has a very in, insightful and telling response. She says, when the gates fall open, who is it that's going to enter? And which is exactly the right question to ask. And what, what Tui ends up doing in order to, in effect, avoid answering the question is he starts to, uh, he starts to throw out a whole barrage of kind of woozy philosophical abstractions intended to undermine the idea that there's a rational answer to the question. Um, and there are interesting parallels between the conversation she has with Tui and then uh, similar things that happen with Keating, uh, also in conversation with Tui and others. When Keating should be having the greatest day of his life, when the Cosmos Lotnick building is opening, he tells himself, I should be happy, but he wasn't. And uh, he feels like he's the only person in the city who is uh, who's uh, feeling nothing and he admits he's bored. Uh, the same thing happens after he marries Dominique. And Frank, uh, Francone says, why don't you look happy? He insists he is, but Francone uh, then himself starts reflecting on how, well, maybe this will all someday be all be yours. Peter, I want my life to have had some meaning. Uh, I want this uh, to, I want to have accomplished something. And Keating's response is revealing, you're not sure of that. You're not sure. And again, here's someone who's doing everything that he thinks is the right thing to do. Now it's by a different standard than Catherine, uh, at least uh, as people usually think of it. 
Uh, he thinks the thing to do in life is to become famous and successful and get all the money and all the fame. Uh, and now he's got it. And yet it's, it seems meaningless to him. And he's defensive about the fact that it might even be meaningful, to, meaningless to someone like, to someone like Frank. Um, and it's worth reflecting back on that exchange that Catherine had had with Tui. Uh, because, I mean, you can sort of understand why somebody like Catherine, who's made herself a social worker and who's explicitly devoted herself to the happiness of others, might not end up being happy. But wouldn't you think that, well, Tui, at least, he's going after things that are supposed to be good for him, uh, fame and, and money and so forth. And why isn't that making him happy? Uh, well, what, who's, the, who's the person here who's supposed to be happy? Catherine had asked that question. Who is it that will enter the, the gates of happiness after I've lost all my identity and merged it uh, with this collective in the way that Tui says she should? Maybe this is a question that Keating should be asking himself as well. And I think especially if you look at some of the things people are saying in the chat, uh, that's, that's very relevant. Um, yeah. Steve says both Keating and Catherine are doing what they have been told is what should make them happy, even though it's different things. Um, yeah. And uh, I think it's interesting also that we get some insights that explain Katie's behavior earlier in the novel. What, you know, in part one, we saw that she would, she would seem seemingly happily wait months, you know, between visits from Keating and not go after him. And, and we see her explaining now why. She, she viewed this as a way in which she's trying not to be selfish. She's trying to be selfless. Um, and so I think we get a little more insight and Gretchen, there. in a comment that she posted earlier, speaks to that. She says, neither Catherine or Peter is doing what they really want to do in life. Peter wanted to be an artist. That's what he originally wanted to do on his own before as people in the chat point out, his mother and others told him to do something different. Catherine, Gretchen says, uh, wanted to serve and support a great man. I assume she means uh, Peter Keating. Uh, we also know she wanted to go to college. She wanted to get a job. She's put these aside as well as her relationship with Keating um, because her uncle has told her that that's uh, not the right way in life. Yeah. Ben, we got a question from Gina in the Q&A module about... Uh, the, the moral perspective that Tui presents to Catherine, and she's asking if this is, if this is uh, reflecting a Kantian morality. Now Kant has, has a, a view of what the good consists of and what it looks like to be virtuous. Do you want to just summarize that in a couple of sentences? Because I think Gina is, is on to something here. Um, the, 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 you know, the idea of, of what counts as a morally virtuous act. Maybe we could just summarize that in a couple of sentences. Very briefly, Immanuel Kant was a German philosopher in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, whose morality, whose moral theory said that what makes an act morally right or justified is not, not anything you achieve, not any consequences. Uh, it's not even your intended consequences. Uh, certainly not any kind of selfish purpose, not even anything that you feel good about doing. What makes it right is uh, that you're doing the right thing for its own sake, by which he means doing your duty, uh, which is explicitly defined in opposition to doing what you want, to doing uh, even what makes you happy. And I mean, there are examples, there are examples that Kant gives where he says, the only way you really know when you're motivated in the right way is when you're feeling pain. Yeah. Uh, and Some pretty hair raising quotes. from. <laughs> and he, and Tui is, I mean, in many ways endorsing these kinds of ideas. I don't know that uh, Ayn Rand is thinking of Kant uh, in particular when uh, she, when she characterizes Keating, she did have a lot of things to say about Kant later. Uh, but th this, this Kantian idea, she thought at least was uh, had influenced a lot of uh, culture and the way that people think about morality and about politics. Uh, and you see that the influence of that in, in characters like, like Keating who were, who were modeled on other intellectuals of that day. Yeah. Now so we, we also, we also got a question from Devana about 
Rourke and his character. And the fourth question that we were going to address today has to do with Rourke. It's essentially the same question. Why does he, why is he seen as sort of uncaring and selfish? How do his relationships confirm or challenge? I think given where we are in the terms of timing, why don't we push that question ahead to next week and we'll add your question, Devana, to that. Yeah, though I would say to Devana, take a look at page 309. Uh, just as a start, and we'll talk about this more later, but 309 is where we see Rourke's interactions with his workers, with his staff, as his firm is growing. And th like you, they initially feel like uh, Rourke is unlikable and unapproachable. Uh, it, those are even the words. They, they did not realize it and would have been shocked to apply such a term as love to their cold, unapproachable, inhuman boss. But it's the term love that they're applying. And so there's something about them that he doesn't that he doesn't express warmth or care about, but there's something else about them that he does. And uh, he responded to the essence of a man, to his creative capacity. Um, and I wanted to also speak to something that Ehrlich, that Ulrich brought up in the chat. Uh, he said he disagreed that an electrician is not creative. I wasn't meaning to imply that earlier about Mike uh, Ulrich. The point was that that uh, Mike wasn't a creative genius. Right. Somebody had asked a question about what, where, where is room in the world for such uh, people as Rourke, uh, for such people other than Rourke, uh, according to the author. And so I was speaking to people about people other than Rourke. Um, we have right. four minutes left, so maybe now is a good time to uh, just see if there are any general questions or comments that people want to make about this uh, this latest part of our reading, we'll have to come back to the question about uh, Rourke's being uh, uncaring and selfish later. I'm sure we'll have good reason to do that. So does anybody want to raise any last questions or make any last comments about any of the general things that we've talked about today already? And, and while we're waiting for questions to come, oh, there's a, there's, uh, let's see. Sam asks an interesting question in the chat. Uh, why is Catherine one of the few people that actually recognizes the threat that Tui imposes? Well, uh, where does she recognize that threat? There are a few places. There's the time when uh, she came to Keating uh, because she was afraid of his shadow. Uh, and she couldn't quite articulate what was so frightening about it, though. And then there's the time in this latest reading where even though she's trying to get his advice to deal with the fact that she's unhappy, she rebels by going, you know, by accepting Keating's overture to marry her, even though, of course, Keating uh, betrays her about that. Um, and she says, I'm not afraid of you, Uncle Ellsworth. So she does recognize there's something threatening about him, but it's important that she doesn't quite know what it is because everything about him that she understands is that he is, a ben he is some kind of benefactor and she thinks he's the kindest person she's ever known. And so on some kind of gut level, she recognizes the threat, but she can't identify what it is. She can't conceptualize it. And I think in that regard, she's like much of the rest of society who, according to you know, society's views about what is benevolent and society's views about what is doing good, Keating, sorry, Tui matches up to all of that. But now we're starting to see there's something off about that conceptualization. Uh, and the fact that Rourke is perceived as uncaring, but actually in his own way uh, is, is, uh, is, is benevolent and worthy of love, his workers are dealing with the same paradox, but in the other, in the other direction. Um, and so this, got, is, this is something yeah. to puzzle about as we go yeah. forward. We got an interesting question from Sonalia, so I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. What if Rourke is wrong sometimes? Is there room in the novel for Rourke to be wrong or to not know something about designing a building? Well, in fact, we have seen examples of that. We saw right at the very beginning, uh, he was looking at his sketches when he got expelled from school and he saw something that had always bothered him. He couldn't quite figure out what it was. And then he realized it in that moment and sat down to work on it. When he goes to work for Henry Cameron, the reason that he wants to go to work for Henry Cameron, that Henry Cameron's looking at his sketches and he says, God, you, you have so much to learn. Like there's, a, there's all kinds of things that are wrong about these buildings. And Rourke says, yeah, that's why I'm here. Um, the Sanborn house, which he the you know, pays house. to have demolished yeah. in part so he can rebuild it. 
right. and there's more he, than just that's... his architecture that that he may be wrong about. Well, I don't want to give away spoilers, but there's going to be uh, things on a more interpersonal level that he may decide he's made mistakes about. And he has questions that he doesn't know the answer to, right? He thought he's he's there's uh, right at the very beginning we get this idea. What is, he's trying to understand? What is the principle behind the dean? Yeah. What is it that motivates men like the dean of his architecture school that's different from the way he? The, you know the the motives that he has in his work um and there's okay. something about those motives that are affecting him and that are playing a role in the conflict that we've been talking about today in the various forms of opposition against him and it's an interesting question should he have paid more attention to those motives at the beginning he was so easily distracted by you know his work that he didn't have time to i mean that'll the, be something this part of the novel ends with ellsworth dewey saying what do you think of me and he says but i don't think of you and, you know, the question is, should you think about him a little exactly. more? <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, we're at time. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, there have been a lot of great comments and questions coming into the chat. And, you know, we try to look at it as much as we can. We try to, and I, do, I do think we're going to do an extra episode at the end where we just go through a lot of the questions that we haven't had a chance to answer. There have been a lot of great ones. Yeah. Um, like Rebecca asked, why does Keating love Katie? That'll be a great one to look at later. Um, so thanks everyone. And again, uh, please, uh, oh, I should, um, I should actually just quickly put up on the screen a reminder of what we're doing next week, May 1st, it's May Day. Uh, and we'll be looking at, uh, actually that's, that should be part three chapters one through nine, not, not chapter 19, uh, but pages 390, uh, through 502. This is the one part in the novel that is, that is, uh, only about nine chapters. And this is the one that's entitled Gail Winant. We're gonna meet that character a lot more for the first time. We've barely seen him. He's the newspaper man who runs the, the banner that Dominique uh, earlier worked for. So stay tuned for more uh, and more drama that we will see developing in the Fountainhead. And I hope to see more of you next week. Thanks everyone. <laughs>